Uh, so it's uh, um, an honor to be here uh, at my first Neuron. I'm really um, uh, excited that you guys invited me to, to give the talk. And I um, also just wanted to say, good job. Uh, this is a, a, a much bigger event than I had anticipated. And I just think it's great that, uh, that it's happening. And uh, hopefully, we'll have a chance to participate as an attendee in future years. Um, so today I'm going to talk about food reward, uh, which is um, basically a function of the integration of mind and metabolism, as Renee was saying. This is a, the psychologist's way of saying we're going to talk about the gut-brain axis. Um, and the gut-brain axis has sort of been a hot topic recently. It's been long known that it's critical for regulating energy balance and metabolism. Uh, but Recent work that is emerging really uh, outlines a role for the gut-brain axis in, in food reinforcement. Uh, and beyond that, in mood. Um, so you hear about vagal stimulation for depression. That's the gut-brain axis. Uh, as well as higher order cognitive functions, including executive functions, working memory, impulsivity. Uh, so this phrase, you are what you eat, this is a pathway by which nutrients can influence even higher order brain functions. So I'm going to start off, I thought, with a, a study I did as a graduate student. Um, I took no end of ribbing from my fellow classmates on the fact that I was doing a study on chocolate. Uh, I, I confess that I did eat my stimuli. Uh, but uh, there, was a, there was a good reason for doing this study. Um, so this was mid-90s, or let's say 1995, 96, and neuroimaging had really just become available. I was actually the first student at McGill to do a neuroimaging study, and this was before fMRI. So this is a PET scanner. Uh, so PET, it, it, it's based on the same principle as fMRI, so neurovascular coupling. You have, uh, you're basically measuring blood flow, which is tied to neuronal firing. Uh, but the temporal resolution of PET is really terrible. So in these studies, you sort of use some activity over about a minute because of the half-life of the tracer. So temporal resolution is bad, but if you're studying feeding, there's a very big advantage. So the subject's head just goes up to here, which is very different from fMRI. So what that means is you can actually go up to your subject and put a square of lint chocolate in their mouth. You don't need a complicated uh, delivery device. And today, still, this is uh, the only neuroimaging study of feeding. So all of the studies of, of feeding and food reward that you will read about in, in neuroimaging um, involves uh, milkshakes and juices and, and because you can only deliver liquids in the scanner. Um, so in this case, what we were interested in is understanding um, the coding of valence um, and, and pleasantness, pleasure. And at this time, in the mid-90s, when neuroimaging was just becoming available, the way that people did this was uh, using the International Effective Picture System. Uh, so in this case, if you were interested in areas that were coding sort of approach versus avoidance or pleasant versus unpleasant, uh, you would compare pictures of uh, sporting events, flowers and babies versus guns, mutilated bodies, and maggots. And then you could isolate the areas responding more to one than the other. And I thought, we can do better than this. We can take a single item, which is really good, chocolate fit the bill, and we can turn that into something that's not so pleasant by feeding people to be on satiety. So that was the, that was the idea behind this study. And really what I was interested in is what, are the, what is the neural circuit that is representing uh, pleasure? That was my interest. So we started off with a square of lint chocolate, and each chocolate bar represents one 60-second PET scan. And the subject simply has the lint chocolate in their mouth, and they let it dissolve. And we look at brain response as they're doing this. And then after the scan, we feed them more chocolate. Uh, and then we scan them again. And then we feed them more chocolate so that their ratings drop. And we continue doing this until they cry uncle. So the top of this scale is delicious, and the bottom is, if you feed me more, I will be sick. Uh, nobody got sick. Um, and I didn't cure chocolate addiction, unfortunately. Everybody went back to it. Uh, but what we did then is take the response over these series of scans and regress it against um, pleasantness ratings. And we isolated this circuit which includes some familiar structures, uh, including the midbrain, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, there's bilateral insula, dorsal striatum, not ventral striatum. That will be a theme through this talk. 
uh, as well as the medial dorsal thalamus. And so I thought back in the late 90s that, okay, great, here we have a circuit, and somehow in, within the machinations of this circuit, there is the uh, required equipment to produce the perception of pleasure, and this is, this is food reward. Okay, so I spent the next um, 10 years uh, as a postdoc and then as junior faculty member when I was at Northwestern, teasing apart this circuit, trying to understand what areas are more responsive to intensity or saliency versus pleasantness or unpleasantness. Uh, how can you disentangle quality from physiological significance? And this was a fruitful area, and I was you know, building up a research program until this study in 2008 that was published by my colleague and now very close collaborator, Yvonne Diarujo. So in your career, when you look back, you will see, you will hopefully see a paper that really sort of changed how everybody thinks about something. So this is a landmark paper. And this, for, for me, and for many people, I think, was one of those papers. So it's a mouse study. And what Yvonne did is he had animals in a cage, hungry and thirsty animals. And there were two sippers. This one had sugar in it, sugar water. And this one was just plain tap water. And he had animals, the mice, come into the cage. In this case, it's a wild type animal. And this guy quickly starts uh, sipping from the sugar sipper because it tastes the sweet, and sweet is good. And so the preference that it forms for the sipper containing sugar is very fast and very strong. Now you take another mouse, and this, this is a knockout mouse. It's a trip M5 knockout mouse. <laughs> it's lacking the molecular machinery to transduce sweet taste. So this is a sweet blind mouse. And if you have this animal, hungry and thirsty again, come into the cage, what you will find is that it samples from both sippers equally because it can't taste sweet. At least this is true for the first 15 minutes or so. So this is the result of a brief access test. And what you can see on the y-axis is the preference ratio. And in the uh, open bars, that's the wild type animal. And you can really see that the animal is licking more from the sugar. So the, the preference is for the sugar sipper over the water sipper. And that's much greater than the dark bars. That's the knockout animal. So it, in the first 15 minutes, the wild type animal drinks the sugar, and the um, knockout has no preference. But after about 15 minutes, that animal actually starts forming a preference. And if you look over here, you can see the late phase. Um, and this really does start at about 15 minutes. And by 45 minutes, this is the behavior you will see. So this is the knockout again. That's the wild type. And this is the preference ratio plotted on the same uh, y-axis. And you can see they're equally strong. So now both animals are spending most of the time licking from the sugar sipper, even though the wild type animal doesn't taste that there's sweet there. And if you did microdialysis to look at extracellular dopamine, and this is in the dorsal striatum, what you would see is that when the animal is licking for sucrose, the change in extracellular dopamine is just as strong in the wild type, in, sorry, in the knockout as the wild type animal. So this is the sucrose here. You don't see it for the sucralose. So this means that you have food reward, food reinforcement, in the absence of taste, in the absence of the orosensory component. So this means that the orosensory component is not required for food reinforcement. But then the question is, what causes the dopamine release? And this is another study from Ivan's lab. Some years later, it took them a while to figure this out, and the answer seems to be, at least for carbohydrates, metabolic signals. So what do I mean by that? So this is, again, another extracellular dopamine recording, again from the dorsal striatum. And in the open circles, you're looking at the rise in extracellular dopamine from an animal looking for sucrose. In the black circles, this is also animals looking for sucrose. But in this case, simultaneously, the animals have had an infusion of 2-deoxyglucose which is an anti-metabolic agent, and it stops the cells from using glucose as a fuel. So the glucose is being consumed, it's in the digestive tract, but it is not being used by the cells as a fuel. And what you see is that you completely blunt the dopamine response. And if you look over here at behavior, you can see that the animals stop looking for it. It's as if it's no longer reinforcing. So what this finding meant, signified, is that in order for the sugar to be reinforcing, it had to be used as a cellular fuel, which means that this food is as reinforcing as it is a useful source of energy, 
which in fact makes infinite sense, right? But it's surprising. So I was really intrigued by this, and having you know been spent 15 years on oral sensation, um, I was a little intimidated by it at first. I didn't like the finding, but I figured, okay, this is pretty convincing. Um, and there was, uh, in the ingestive behavior and flavor literature, a phenomenon that was really reminiscent of this. It's called flavor nutrient conditioning. And this is the paradigm that we decided to use in humans to begin to investigate whether or not these sorts of signals drive reinforcement and perception and pleasure uh, in, in humans. So I'm going to show you, first of all, the experiment from the animal literature. Uh, so again, we have, this is a, ma a rat in this case, um, hungry and thirsty in a cage with a sipper again. In, in this case, the sipper has a flavor. The flavor will just say flavor A. There are no calories in here, uh, but it is slightly sweet because it's got sucralose and it has a flavor. And it's hooked up to a lick detector so that when the animal licks, a switch is flipped and a nutrient is infused directly into the gut of the animal. So what this does then is it allows the animal to learn to associate this flavor, which becomes your CS plus, with the post-ingestive effect, let's say in this case, glucose. So here you have energy, you have glucose in the gut, and you have a flavor here. You can make this pairing, and, the, and this should become a CS plus. Now you take the same animal on a second day, hungry and thirsty again, and this time in the sipper you have flavor B. And you have the same setup, but this time when the lick is detected and the switch is flipped, saline is infused. So you have no energy here. So this becomes your CS minus flavor. Then you can ask the animal, even after a single pairing, which one of these two flavors it prefers on a third day, again hungry and thirsty, simply by measuring how much of each of the sippers it consumes. And this is data from Tony Sclafani's lab. And what you can see here is that there is a really an overwhelming preference for the flavor that had been paired with the post-ingestive effect of the glucose over the one that had been paired with saline. So whatever is happening here is super reinforcing. Uh, and even in a single trial, just like conditioned taste aversion learning, you can have conditioned flavor preference learning. It's very strong. It's very fast. And it also depends on dopamine. So if you um, block D1 signaling in particular in any one of these areas, you can disrupt this, this form of learning. So we wanted to use this paradigm to investigate flavor preferences in humans and try to understand if it's related to metabolic signals. So this was a study with Yvonne. And we didn't infuse anything into the gut uh, because that would disrupt the purpose of a positive experience for the subject. Uh, instead, what we did was we started with five novel beverages. Um, they were flavored with sucralose and a little bit of citric acid. And then the flavors were things like horchata or bilberry. It's impossible to tell you what that is. They're kind of fruity. Uh, they were not really that good. We wanted the pleasantness to kind of be low so that we could uh, increase it by pairing one of them with flavors. Uh, sorry, with uh, energy. So we had people come into the lab and rate these beverages for how much they liked them. And then we chose two that were rated as similarly liked. And one of them was going to become our CS plus and one the CS minus. And the CS plus, we made a CS plus by adding calories from maltodextrin. So maltodextrin is a glucose polymer. It's used in a lot of foods. If you consume it, it breaks down really quickly in the gut to glucose. Uh, but in the mouth, it has very little oral sensation because the molecule is quite big. It doesn't bind to the sweet taste receptor. And in fact, if you put it in solution with flavor, you can't even really taste it. So this was actually developed for cancer patients to avoid conditioned taste aversion learning. So we used it um, because we wanted the CS plus to, to be perceived as exactly the same whether or not it had the US, the energy in it or not. So we did triangle tests to make sure that people um, couldn't detect it simply by giving people three different cups, all of the same flavor. Two of them, in this case, have no calories, and then one is from a bottle that had calories, and they have to pick the odd one out. And they do this eight times. And if somebody can do this, then they were excluded from the experiment. About one in 15 people can do this. It's probably a receptor, a polymorphism in the, in the receptor. Um, so those people were not part of this, this study. Uh, and then the rest of them, uh, so most of the subjects, we schedule for exposure days. Now on the exposure days, this is the only time when the CS plus will have the energy in it. Um, and what happens in the exposure days is the subject comes in in the morning at about 11.30. 
we ask them to rate their hunger, and then we insert a catheter. And the, catheter, the catheter is just about 15 minutes before we ask them to drink a beverage over a five-minute period. And um, the first sample we take is immediately prior to the subjects drinking the beverage. And what we're looking at is plasma glucose. And then after about half an hour since they've drank the beverage, we take a second sample because this is approximately when glucose should be uh, peaking in, in circulation after drinking the, the beverage. And so what, what we have here is a, a proxy measure for the amount of glucose that is at least available in order to be metabolized. So we're interested in looking at the change or glucose excursion from pre to post beverage and whether or not that's related to our conditioning. Uh, then we fed the subjects lunch, they went away, they came back, we repeated the procedure in the evening, and then we gave them a bottle to take home with them the next morning to consume when they were hungry. So for each exposure day, the subject has three opportunities to learn to associate a flavor with its post-ingestive effect, um, and this is the only time that there are calories present. Then they return for a post-test. And in the post-test, we do a neuromaging study. So this is now fMRI. Uh, you can see the, uh, the liquids loaded here in syringe pumps and being uh, pumped into the subjects in the scanner via this uh, taste manifold here. So our stimuli are half a cc of liquid dropping into your mouth. And they also see the, they see the bottle, which has been color-coded to help them distinguish it. And we want to know what areas of the brain are responding more to the CS plus than the CS minus. So that's a simple analysis, and then we regress it against the glucose excursion here. And when you do that, what, we f what you see is bilateral, whole brain corrected nucleus accumbens responses and hypothalamic response. So these are very strong responses. And the response is on the y-axis, so that's the bold signal, greater in the CS plus than the CS minus. And on the x-axis is the changes in the glucose excursion when the subject was drinking this drink versus this drink days earlier, right? So this is change in blood glucose. This is the metabolic impact of drinking this versus this. And what you can see is that the response, so the extent to which you've conditioned a brain food cue response to a calorie predictive cue really depends on how much glucose that beverage induced an increase or how much increase in glucose associated with drinking that beverage days earlier. So that's consistent then with the animal study where you're having, um, where you need to, the cells have to oxidize the glucose in order to have a release in dopamine. So it suggests that this post-ingestive effect has, at least in humans, a proxy measure, changes in blood glucose, but the glucose has to be in the blood in order to be used. So this is the first step. Now what was interesting um, is Although we did see changes in pleasantness, so this, this is a gold standard rating scale for looking at liking of various stimuli. Um, and as I said, uh, we started off with the beverages not being too liked, so just a little bit above like, slight, slight, liked slightly. Um, and then after, in the open bars, you can see the pleasantness ratings. And they do go up a tiny bit from like slightly to a little bit less than like moderately. This is a very small effect. It's not that impressive. It's certainly not like those animals with the overwhelming preference for the glucose zipper. But it did increase. It increased a little bit for both. This was the only significant one. Didn't change for the control. But when we looked at these changes in liking ratings and we regressed it against the brain response, you see that in the nucleus accumbens and in the hypothalamus, so that's this, this is all the nucleus accumbens graphs, the hypothalamus graphs, and the, again, the response is on the y-axis and on the x-axis, you have the changes in liking. So this is CS plus versus CS minus flavor, and this is just the CS plus at the post-test. And what you can see is there's really no relationship, John likes this, <laughs> between changes in liking or pleasure, subjective experience, and responses in the nucleus accumbens or the hypothalamus. Rather, if you take those ratings and you look elsewhere, you can see in the insular cortex here, which is primary taste cortex, a little bit anterior. It's where taste and odor are integrating. It's sensory cortex, that, and it's sensitive to changes in sensation, changes in the liking. But in this case, it's both the CS plus and the CS minus drink compared to the unexposed drink. So what this means is that there are areas of the brain sensitive to changes in liking. Changes in liking is happening, in this case, sort of as a function of just exposure. And it cannot, therefore, be 
uh, dependent on a post-ingestive effect because there is no post-ingestive effect here. And it's also a completely separate circuit because it is unrelated to those nucleus accumbens responses. So this study then showed us that conditioning striatal hypothalamic responses whoop, to a calorie, oh, is that true? Yeah. I should be having some arrows, but they're not there. Mac to PC is my, uh, anyways, okay. So, um, so what we found is that conditioning those responses um, to a calorie predictive cue really does seem to be depend at least on something related to changes in blood glucose, to, so to a post-ingestive effect. Um, but importantly, the circuits that were sensitive to these post-oral changes in plasma glucose are separate from those that are sensitive to the changes in liking, which does also happen. So this was interesting to us, and we wanted to follow it up. And the most um, obvious next step is simply a dose-response curve. So this is a four-year, four-postdoc study. I'm happy to report that Marcha, Keith, Barca, and Niels all have their own labs now. So this didn't hold them up. They had other side projects going on. Um, and this is this is a whole this was a whole saga. So it seemed like a really easy idea, right? We're going to look to see if you have more calories, you should have more conditioning. More energy should be more reinforcing. That's the basic idea. So we started with um, five stimuli. This is the one we had in the previous experiment. So this is 112.5 kilocal paired flavor, and this is the non-caloric CS minus. And we just added different steps along the way, up to 150 kilocals, which is equivalent to a can of Pepsi. So this is sort of ecological range of, of um, doses. We've flavored all of the stimuli, or we, we sweetened all of the stimuli with sucralose. Uh, and we added the amount of sucralose that would have been equivalent sort of to the middle dose had this been table sugar. So we are using ta table sugar as our reference. But we wanted to have them all equally sweet because we didn't want sweet to play a role in this because we're really interested in the effect of energy on conditioning, not the effect of sweetness. Okay, so that was the design. Here's the liking ratings. This is before, by design, not liked very much for the five different flavors. And the question is, at post-test, where do you see the increase in liking? We were hoping for 75. Uh, we did see an increase for the 115, uh, the 112.5, I should say, and this was significant, so it replicated the prior study. But again, look, it's a very small perceptual effect, but it's consistent. But the surprise was that the liking for the 150 actually went down, and this difference was significant. Now, the postdoc, Keith, at the time was quite, quite upset by these findings, and two things could happen that could, could be real or this could just be a really difficult experiment and it didn't work. So imagine this experiment. You have these 15 people coming into the lab. They're with us for about a month each because they have to come into the lab five different times and learn these associations. So maybe it was just too hard. But when we looked at the neuroimaging data and we modeled it in various ways to look to see if there was an effect of calories, there was actually a very strong effect of calories. It was just nonlinear. So what we found, and this is just the midbrain. When you compared, for example, the 115 versus the 112, here you see bilateral responses in the midbrain that were greater to the 112.5 versus the 150. So the brain response was paralleling the perceptual changes. Of course, it doesn't really make any sense because evolutionarily, you want to learn to like the food that provides you with the most energy because you need energy to survive should be a very conserved, very high fidelity mechanism. So this was rather strange. Now if we think about the hypothesis that we're going with and the, and the evidence from the animal data, that, those earlier findings would make the following prediction. The prediction would be that if you drank this beverage, the 112.5 kilocal beverage, you should have a greater metabolic response than if you drank the beverage that had 150 kilocals. That's what the data say. Now, as an experimenter and as just people you know, uh, having experience with food, you would say this doesn't really make any sense. Now, you can actually test this, and it turns out to be quite cheap to test, which is fortunate. It took me a while to convince somebody to help me to do this, because I'm a psychologist, and this requires metabolic measurement. 
But you can use indirect calorimetry, which is very inexpensive, very non-invasive, easy experiment to test this hypothesis. So why not? We decided to do that. So this experiment, we had people come in over three days, always at the same time of the day, always hungry. And we are going to look at their resting energy expenditure before and after they consume each of these different drinks. Now, when you eat something, you produce what's called dietary-induced thermogenesis, or the thermic effect of food. So basically, you use energy to metabolize the energy, and that energy is commensurate with the amount of calories or the energy that is present. And so you can have this, this is like a measure of the metabolic impact of, of the thing that you're consuming. And so we're going to look at dietary-induced thermogenesis, and the prediction is that you should see greater changes for the 112.5 compared to the 150. So this now, what you're going to look at is the change in REE, resting energy expenditure, post versus pre for the different drinks. And that's the, that's the control. That's the non-caloric beverage. You can see our standard. And then that's the 112.5, about 10% increase. So you, that's dietary-induced thermogenesis. That's all expected. The question is, what happens to the 150? Now, I would predict that it should be about here. Uh, the data predict that it should be here. And the data were right, because at no time did the change in energy expenditure ever differ from the zero cal beverage. So this means people were consuming this beverage, and they were not burning that, the glucose that was present. So it's consistent with the previous study. It still doesn't really make a lot of sense, but it's intriguing. Um, and these are the best kinds of results that you can ever get in your career because you just know you're going to learn something new if you're persistent. So what you need is a good experiment, and you need to be sure about it. It doesn't matter that you might not know what's happening. That's science. So we were following up on this. The first thing we wanted to do is to repeat everything because, you know, it's weird. Um, so we had... Um, Subjects come in, this is a separate group again, and repeat everything, and this is the REE data, and you can see we completely replicate the effect. We also had them do neuroimaging. It's a small N, and that's because this was sponsored by Pepsi, but they pulled their funding <laughs> as soon as we had the prior uh, results. So this was the little bit that we cobbled together left. This is a reality check for us. Um, and so what you can see here is changes in resting energy expenditure from the CS plus versus the CS minus in the nucleus accumbens, so using the peak from the prior study as a region of interest. And you can see there is a relationship. Here again is the liking. So this is just another example of this tiny difference, but again, it's really consistent. So very consistently, you learn to like and perceive as more pleasant the flavor that had been paired with the 112.5 kilocals. Here, there was no change for the uh, 150. So it's consistent. Then came the next surprise. So this graph here, C, is just this data collapsed across time. So this is now looking at resting energy expenditure for the 112, which is greater than the 0, and the 150, which is not greater than 0. That's this data. But this is plasma glucose. And what you can see very clearly is that Change in plasma glucose is significant for the 112.5. Oh, I think I lost my pointer. So that is significant, but so is this. So what this means is that when you consume the, the drink, uh, the glucose is going into your gut, it's being absorbed into your blood. That is not enough to drive conditioning. It has to cause, it has to be used as a fuel. So exactly like the animal data, so this weird finding is fortuitous because it gives us the opportunity to say that in humans, like in animals, it does really seem that there's a metabolic signal that is critical for conditioning, that, and which is the key marker of, of reinforcement. But again, it sort of makes no sense. And so we're still left with what's going on. And this is now postdoc number four, uh, brainstorming what is going on. So at the beginning, what I told you is that we made all of the beverages similarly pleasant and, or similarly sweet. And the reason we did this is because we did not want sweet to play a role in our experiment. But what we did, in fact, was make sweet play a really important role in our experiment because we had made stimuli that don't exist in nature. 
right? So normally sweetness is an indicator of sugar. And so more sweet equals more energy. So the, the stimuli should have looked like that. So what we had done is we had created beverages that were not sweet enough or that were too sweet. And we thought, what if sweet is regulating the metabolic response? So we know from prior studies in humans and in animals that if you have a, a cue that's related to energy, you have what's called a cephalic phase response. So if you put sweet taste in an animal's mouth and you look at insulin response, you, you see an insulin response. So we thought maybe taste could, I mean, it is affecting metabolism. Maybe it could be regulating these metabolic responses. So to test this, we set up a two-by-two two design where we had two different levels of sweetness, again with sucralose, and two different levels of calories, again with maltodextrin. So the doses were 75 kilocal and 150 kilocal. And these two beverages then are um, twice the amount of calories, but they're matched. So this one is as sweet as it should be if there was 75 kilocals there from table sugar. And this one is as sweet as it should be, so it's sweeter, twice as sweet, because there's twice as many calories there. The other two beverages are mismatched. So same calories, same sucralose there, but they're just mismatched in this case. And the prediction is we should see greater changes in resting energy expenditure for the matched compared to the mismatched flavors. And we could, again, look at that using indirect calorimetry. And when we did, what you see in the green are the matched, and these in orange are the mismatched. Clearly, there is greater uh, dietary-induced thermogenesis with the matched compared to the mismatched beverages. And you can see the time series here, not quite as clean as what I've been showing you, but it's the exact same calories. So it's really just taste and, you know, just a tiny little bit of sucralose because it's a very high affinity ligand. So this is a small manipulation and you're getting this big difference in, um, in metabolism. And we also did it for the 112.5 because that's what we had been looking at. And again, you see th the same effect. So what this meant then is that metabolic response, independently of the caloric load, independently of the caloric load, regulates the association of food cues with their nutritional value in the mesolimbic system. But, and, and this was a big surprise, this metabolic response seems to be regulated by taste. So this is like this bi-directional, highly interactive gut-brain axis that is critical for regulating carbohydrate reward but it, it, it's, it's dependent not just on the metabolic signals, but also on the, on the gustatory, on the orosensory signals. Um, and we also did see small shifts consistently in liking. So it's influencing perception, but it's via a separate circuit. And this sometimes results in this strange situation where you can have less caloric beverages be more reinforcing than high caloric beverages. And so at this point, you're probably wondering, well, there's a lot of artificial sweetener out there in the environment. <laughs> what is happening long term if you consume these sorts of things? Now, here's the bad news. Splenda, I mean, it's great that there's no calories. It makes, per I mean, it was a wonderful idea to come up with sweet without energy. Um, and we've been very good at doing that. And now, actually, there's many different artificial sweeteners, and they're cheaper than sugar, which means that they're in more and more and more products. Not only do we want to make things less caloric, it's advantageous for companies to, to spend less money making their projects because it, uh, their products because it increases the profit margin. Not to mention situations like this, where you have the Diet Coke and the French fries or the Big Mac. So there's over 3,000 products currently in the marketplace that have both sucralose and some sort of energy there. And then there's the products that just have the Diet Coke or the Diet Pepsi, whatever, and then you consume them alongside some carbohydrate. So the question is, given these weird effects, um, does this have any long-term consequences? And this is sort of an aside from the food reward, but this is a paper that's coming out um, in the next issue of Cell Metabolism. So I thought I'd just go through it really quickly because I always get this question. This was, this is an example of serendipity. So this this study, we did not do to answer this question, but it does answer the question. So sometimes uh, you get lucky, and this is one of those circumstances. Um, so what we were actually doing was um, evaluating the uncoupling hypothesis. This is a hypothesis put forth by Susie Swithers and Terry Davidson. It's based on learning theory. The idea 
is that if you keep having a sweet taste without its unconditioned stimulus, without its reward, then you should get extinction because the sweet taste is no longer a good predictor of the unconditioned stimulus. In which case, the conditioned stimulus, sweet taste, should be less effective at eliciting conditioned responses, such as insulin release. So the idea is that over time, with all this inconsistent pairing of having sweet with or without calories, you may disrupt the ability of sweet to guide food intake because it's no longer meaning energy or to elicit cephalic phase responses. And they've done a whole series of studies in animals showing that this can actually disrupt um, glucose metabolism and result in changes in some of the hormonal responses. And um, subsequently, they have shown increased weight gain in animals exposed to um, inconsistent pairings between sweet taste and energy. So we wanted to evaluate this in humans. And we used our typical setup, our beverages, with sucralose. Um, and we had a condition where people came into the lab. Uh, over a two-week period, they're going to have seven of these bottles over two weeks. And they're going to drink them in the lab. And the, the experimental stimulus is uh, this beverage with, sweetened with two packets of Splenda, which people have in coffee. So this is an ecological dose. Then we're going to have a bottle that is sweetened in another group uh, with sucrose. Uh, to be equally sweet to the Splenda. But then we have this control condition, and this turns out to be the important part, uh, that the animal experiments didn't have. So in this case, what we have is Splenda, but we added maltodextrin. So that this, you have the ligand, the Splenda, the sucralose, but in this case, it's not uncoupled. So here you get the sweet taste without the calories. Here you have the exact same stimulus, but it's not uncoupled. You have the calories. So the prediction is that you see, should see changes here and not here if the uncoupling hypothesis is true. And so we did pre and post tests. We looked at perception, so how much people liked these things, how sensitive they were to sweet taste. We did an oral glucose tolerance test, which is sort of the gold standard for looking at glucose metabolism. And then we did neuroimaging with our flavors to look to see if brain response is changing to the sweet taste to sugar, but not to salty, sour, savory, other tastes. Um, and when we did this, pre and post, what we found, to our surprise, so the, on, the, on the left here, that's changes in blood glucose. This is the sucralose group, the sucrose group, and the combination group. And you can see there's no change from baseline. But if you look over here at insulin, you can see that, in fact, it's the combination group, our control, that has an increase in plasma glucose. It's small, but it's significant. It's only seven bottles over two weeks. And what this means is that you need to release more insulin to have the same level of blood glucose. Now, that's an adaptive response, but it, me it, it suggests that you're, in, you're less sensitive to insulin. So this is a marker for disrupted glucose metabolism. And it was in our control, which was, again, strange. Um, so this is an adult sample. At the same time, we were also doing this with adolescents. And when we saw that finding, uh, the Yale HIC asked us to stop and check the adolescent data. And what we saw was the same thing, but this is with fasting insulin and glucose because it's less invasive than doing an oral glucose tolerance test. These are kids. Two of the kids that were in the combo group, you can see their fasting insulin went from totally normal to, in this case, this is pre-diabetic range. So Yale shut the study down, as they should have. Now, you can't really do statistics on this, and it's a small sample, so it biases you towards finding significant effects. But if you do permutation testing, it is, it is significant. And, and most importantly, it's consistent with the adult, the adult study. We also, of course, had the neuroimaging data. And when we looked at the neuroimaging data, what we're doing is we're looking at brain response to the sweet taste compared to the other tastes in the three different groups. And what you can see here is in the midbrain, in the cingulate cortex, and in the insula, quite significantly in the insula, what you see is that the response to the sweet taste, but not the other tastes, decreases here. So that's response on the y-axis as a function of changes in insulin that that subject has. So if you became less insulin sensitive, you also had a reduced brain response to sweet. So you're having decreases in both the central 
and the peripheral response to sugar as the function of these seven beverages over two weeks. And this is interesting, right, because central circuits are regulating metabolism. We've known that for a long time, including regulating things like nutrient partitioning, which I'm expect expecting none of you are studying metabolism, you're studying the brain. Nutrient partitioning simply means the fuel that your cells are using at any one time. Uh, carbohydrate and fat are the major sources of energy. And at any one time, you're burning more of one versus the other. They have a circadian rhythm. But it's the brain that helps orchestrate what fuel is being used at any one time. And so we thought that this strong change in central response to sweet taste may be influencing how nutrient partitioning is being regulated, because in particular, Nutrient partitioning depends critically on insulin res um, responses in animals. And so we worked with a colleague at the University of Paris, this is Serge Luquet, uh, who works with mice, and he has these metabolic chambers. Um, now these metabolic chambers, they can look at dietary-induced thermogenesis, but also nutrient partitioning in animals over 24 hours. So we create, this is a reverse translational study, which is fun to do if you do human work, because uh, every once in a while you get some basic discovery in humans that you can reverse translate to animals. And so what we did was we created our human experiment for the mice. The major difference here is that mice and rats, they love maltodextrin. For them, it tastes like something. It doesn't taste like sweet, because you don't get generalization to sweet condition diversions probably tastes starchy, I don't know, but because we didn't know, we thought let's not use polycose, let's not use maltodextrin in the animals. Instead what we did was we used sucrose and sucralose, but we half the dose so that, there's the, so that it's not like overly sweet. And we're actually working against ourselves here because we're using less calories in order to get the effect. And the animals received um, over seven days, so there is some training just to get used to the environment, and then they get 1.5 mils of this solution in the dark phase every day. So they're not consuming other food, they're just getting the drink by itself. And they do this over seven days, and you can look simply at the nutrient, at the, the, the fuel that the animal is, is using. So in A, this just shows you, this is the, the time here, and this is um, c consumption. So you can see here, all of the animals are consuming the same amount of each of the different beverages. And yet, if you look at resting energy expenditure, you can see that actually there is um, greater change in metabolism to the sucrose compared to both the other ones. Now, this is more caloric, but th there is calories here, but it's not being burned. And if anything, this is the, the blue is the, is the combo. You can see there's actually reduced... Um, RQ. So that means these animals are burning more fat than, than carbohydrate. So anything like above, so, so the closer you get to one, the more carbohydrate you're burning, and the closer you get down here, the, the more um, fat you're burning. And so what this is sh saying is that the animals over the entire day consuming all of their, their meals, they tend to be just burning more fat than carbohydrate. So the way they're using fuel is changing. Um, which is only in the combo group, so just like the human study. And if you look here, this is, the, I think, the really important finding. So this now is the food quotient. So this is um, across total caloric intake, summed across the days. This is how much the animal's consuming, mostly of chow, because it's only 1.5 mil of this beverage, how much they have to consume in order to shift from, fat, from burning fat, using fat, to burning carbohydrate. And what you can see is the slopes differ. So the animals that have had this combination have to eat more in order to shift their metabolism to burn carbohydrate. So that is a change in the way the fuel is being used. So it suggests or it shows that in humans, even this minimal exposure which occurs in, in our daily life, you can begin to see insulin insensitivity, and you can see differences in brain response to sweet. And in mice, you have a similar effect, which suggests that the effect actually is influencing or changing. There's an adaptation in central circuits that are regulating metabolism. So the uncoupling hypothesis doesn't seem to be correct. But there is something about this dysregulation 
when you have these mismatched conditions. So my note to you going forward, you're about to have lunch after this, is stay away from the sucralose and the equal, and the, uh, yeah, and, and I no longer have artificial sweeteners with your hamburger. Now, if you want a Diet Coke in the middle of the day and you're not going to eat anything else, it seems to be fine. Okay. So that's the first part. How am I doing for time? I know we had 10 minutes? Oh, tops. Okay, so I'm going to go through this pretty fast. And I'm going to leave out the last part. But I think this is important because when you think about food reward, you think about a single thing. And you tend to think about it as energy. But we've just seen that you can get conditioning that's not dependent on the amount of energy present. It's calorie independent. It depends on a metabolic response. Now, food, as I've been talking about energy, there's multiple sources. There's carbohydrate and there's fat. Primarily, there's also protein. And these different energy sources have different metabolic pathways. Therefore, it's down to reason that the mechanisms that are driving reinforcement for different, different nutrients could be different, and they are. So there's a parallel story for fat. And this is now back to Yvonne's lab. We'll go to the big one here. This is another landmark paper. Uh, if you're going to read any paper from this talk, read this one. It's really amazing. I had nothing to do with it, but it's a beautiful study. So they use viral vector tracing um, coupled with optogenetics to define a pathway from cells in the upper intestine that are normally lipid sensing that projects all the way up to the dorsal striatum, not the ventral striatum. So what they did is they used viral vectors to find where these cells were projecting to. So they go through the vagus nerve, that's here, and they synapse in the nodose ganglion. And they were able to label just those cells that are receiving information from those cells down here in the intestine. Then what they did is they put channel rhodopsin into the nodose ganglion, and they labeled the terminals of those cells in the nucleus of the solitary tract. And then they allow the animal to stimulate optogenetically, so for light, to activate those cells in the nodose ganglion that are terminating in the nucleus of the solitary tract. And those animals, sure enough, learned to self-administer. So this is brain self-stimulation. This is quintessential reinforcement. What this means, and this is over day and it continues into extinction, is that these animals are nose poking to activate their intestinal cells. So this is a reinforcing pathway. Those cells in your intestine are regulating central circuits that are associated with dopamine release. And if you look at microdialysis, you see this is the same sort of setup. Again, dorsal striatum, you have a nice rise in extracellular dopamine when the experimenters activate with light those cells in the NTS. Now what is interesting is that this pathway projects to the substantia nigra, not the VTA. It's very specific. And to the dorsal striatum and not the ventral striatum, which is, which is pretty fascinating. Um, and under normal circumstances, this pathway is lipid sensing. So what you can see here, this is Ivan's lab, and similar to his other experiments with carbohydrate, when animals lick for lipid, actually they're not licking, they're getting it infused in the gut. And so no oral sensation. When you have fat in the gut, you get a rise in extracellular dopamine. That's true for the animals that are fed a low-fat diet. You take these animals and you put them on a high-fat diet for 16 weeks, they gain no weight. Their metabolic responses are all the same, so no change. So this is just a direct effect of nutrient. And you can see how blunted that dopamine response is in those animals. And they also show changes in behavior. So these are the low-fat fed, and these are the high-fat fed. That's the difference I want you to look at right now. That's a big difference. Basically, the animals fed the high-fat diet could care less that there is a low-fat food available. So the, nor the, healthy, the healthy animals that have been on the low-fat diet, they, really, they, they lick for the low-fat emulsion present in the sipper. The animals that have been on the high-fat diet, it's like they could care less that it's there. And so we wanted to know if this actually translates into humans. And so we did a study. This was at the Max Planck when I was visiting professor there, where we put healthy Germans on a diet. Um, we had them consume one of these yogurt things that Germans eat all the time. 
um, one per day for 12 we uh, eight weeks. And uh, the yogurts were similarly energetic, but one was high in, or one was low in fat and sugar and one was high in fat and sugar. And then we did testing pre and post. And I'm going to go through this quickly. We did the usual stuff. We looked at perception. We looked at adiposity. We did our neuroimaging study. This is showing you that there's no change in their body weight or their metabolic measures. But when you look at brain response to milkshake, here you see in the dorsal striatum a decrease in the people that have been consuming just one yogurt a day with high fat, high sugar in it, compared to the people that are consuming the high protein yogurt. So just like in the animals, you're getting a decrease. And if you look at perception, you also see decreases. Now this is wanting ratings and liking ratings for the low fat, for a, a low fat, um, in this case, chocolate uh, dessert. And their, their preferences for the low fat dessert are decreasing. So this is the blue are the people that are on the high fat diet, and this is the pretest. This is midway through the experiment, and this is post-test. This is within subject design. So they're decreasing. Their sensitivity is not changing. So they're equally sensitive to fat. It's just that they're, they don't care anymore, or they're, they're, they're liking less. The preference for the low fat shifts, um, which is just like the animals. Um, I'm going to go through this part here, because uh, this is just showing you can reverse it in animals and in humans, because um, I, I want to get to this. So we've been talking about these two pathways. I spent most of the time on the carbohydrate pathway. And I've written about these pathways in more depth uh, in this paper. And we've talked a little bit about the fat pathway. And it does seem that they're independent. And I didn't go through all that evidence today. But one question we had was whether or not these two signals might interact. And this is a really important question, because if you think about the food that you might be craving or that you do crave, I bet you that food has fat and carbohydrate in it. So pizza, chocolate, ice cream, all of these things have fat and carbohydrate in it. Now, if you think about the environment that we evolved in, there is very, very few, if any, foods that have high fat and high carbohydrate. The exception is breast milk. But most food either is plant-based and it has carbohydrate, or it's animal-based and it has protein and fat. You don't really get them together. And humans, especially early hominids, were opportunistic eaters, so they tended to eat one or the other. So the question is, can these reinforcing signals, which are independent, interact at the level of the brain to potentiate reward? Because this could be a mechanism by which modern food environment uh, uh, promotes overeating, especially of these types of food. So we used. <laughs> Uh, auction task, which is a standard task. This is again done at the Max Planck Institute. This is with um, Alex DeFelice Antonio, uh, Geraldine, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Copin, now, who's now at the University of Geneva, and Alex just started her lab at Virginia Tech. And this is Mark Titzkemeyer at the M MPI. So we use this, um, the Becker de Groot Marshak auction task. You've probably heard of this before. It's a very common task to compare re or to, to index reinforcement value. And so in our task, we had food pictures, and people are bidding for them. They come in on the first day, and they just simply tell us how much they like the foods. Again, done in Germany, lots of sausages, lots of cheese. So some of the foods in this case are high in fat and low in carb. Some are high in both fat and carb. And some are high in carb but low in fat. And on the first day, people just simply say how many calories they think are in these things and how much they like them. Then the next day, we do a neuroimaging study where we give them five euro. And they're told they're going to be bidding against the computer for these different items. And they're told that if they win, then after the neuroimaging experiment, and they're hungry, they have to sit around for half an hour. But if they win, they get to eat the thing that they bid for. So, so, so what they're doing is they're bidding, but they're thinking about the value. So this is a, a manipulation to get them thinking about the value of the food. And when we do this, this is a previous result that's showing bid amount here f for a similar task, but it wasn't broken down by macronutrient, and then caloric density. So the caloric density is driving bid amount. You can see here. And this is the actual energy density. This is estimated energy density, no relationship. So people are bidding more for the high energy dense foods, even though they don't know there's more energy in them. So this is a really unconscious signal. And we replicated these findings in our study. So um, willingness to pay 
bidding amount is, is dependent on the actual energy density more so than the estimated energy density. But the interesting thing is whether or not they'll pay more. So what you see here is calories shown, familiarity, and liking for the three different groups, carb, fat, and fat plus carb. And you can see they're similar in all the cases. Yet, if you look down here, people will bid more for those foods that had the fat and the carbohydrate in them. So this was along, went along with our hypothesis. And if you model brain response when people are bidding for the combination foods versus the fat or the carb, you can see, again, dorsal striatum, greater responses, and also ventromedial prefrontal and thalamus, greater responses when you're bidding for the food that has both fat and carbohydrate, which suggests that the pathways interact. So uh, do they interact? Yes, probably. Um, I'm going to finish with uh, a figure from a paper that I wrote with Yvonne recently um, in annual reviews called Rethinking Food Reward. And it puts forth a two-road model, which is very much like Joe Ledoux's model of fear and threat. And the idea is that there are these two separate pathways, a conscious pathway and an unconscious pathway. And if you really want to understand reinforcement, all the signals down here. So there are metabolic signals that are regulating these central circuits that are really critical for driving food choice. Now, if you want to think about the obesity epidemic, you want to make a bet on which of these pathways is, is more likely to be implicated. This is a graph from the last 170 people that came through my lab. These are pleasantness ratings of milkshake, chocolate, and strawberry. And that's BMI on the y-axis. There is as close to no relationship between BMI and how much people say they like milkshakes, almost zero relationship. And if you look now, we're starting to look more at these post-ingestive effects, and that's really where you're seeing the differences, and with things like effort, willingness to squeeze for food reward. So uh, to sum up, there's separate pathways. Dopamine circuits and food choices are really dependent on these unconscious metabolic signals. That's point number one. Point number two is that the modern food environment is influencing these pathways in unanticipated ways that could have important implications for understanding ingestive behavior, but now you can also get an idea for how this might affect mood or other neural functions. And with that, I'll just acknowledge uh, the people who did the work, many of whom you've met along the way, and also funding from uh, National Institutes of Health. And again, thanks for your attention. <laughs> doing for time okay good we have about five minutes for questions John. Hi. that was that was incredible I really loved it it was really good Thanks. um so I have a sort of big picture question about vocabulary because one of the things that I think that scientists don't sometimes think about is the words one uses are as important as let's say your magnets and my HPLC so you're what I read into this is not only a question of rethinking re reward, I even wonder, what's the utility of the term reward when most of what you're studying is really reinforcement? The term reward for a lot of people evokes the idea of hedonia and liking. Mm -hmm. And so different, this is almost like a, the term reward is almost like a Rorschach inkblot for scientists who see whatever, <laughs> you know, you want the bubble over one person's head and they're thinking pleasure. Dopamine is the pleasure center. But then, and, I mean, in reality, your focus on the dorsal striatum, what is the basic science of dorsal striatum show? It's really more related to reinforcement, action, outcome, association, habit formation, all of which is under the rubric of reinforcement. And so, so you'll pardon me, but I was monitoring your word usage <laughs> during the talk, and reward was in the title, but what was in the actual slides and the data and everything else was either liking, hedonic rating, or reinforcement, right? Yeah. Uh, that paper that was entitled uh, um, the, that the gut pathway involved in food reward, what they demonstrated was an involvement in food reinforcement defined, uh, you know, the classical psychological uh, definition. So what are your thoughts ab yeah. about that? People continue to use the word and then you have to qualify your usage of it. What's the utility of the term reward? 
I think it's a great question. And in fact, it's the question that I asked at the end of uh, the 10th year anniversary neuroimaging of obesity symposium at NIH. And there was a lot of discussion and no conclusion. Uh -huh. And I've discussed this with Yvonne also, who is the author of that cell, that cell paper, and my co-author on Rethinking Food Reward, which was originally titled by me, Rethinking Food Reinforcement. <laughs> so uh, there's been many discussions about it. I like to think of this as this was data-driven. And I was thinking about reward in the broad context I was interested in pleasure. And so I guess when I say reward, and this is how Ivan thinks about reward, is we're trying to include all of the factors, and it could even be like top down, that are involved in motivated behavior. Now it is true when you say reward, it gets really murky very quickly, and there's a lot of misinterpretation that can result from it. But if we said reinforcement, then we're, being ex we're excluding all these other things, which, which do play a, ro a role. And in fact, my interest is in understanding how they're integrated. I don't think that pleasure plays no, no role. In fact, I think that it might be a cause for good in terms of food decisions, because it would shift you more to a goal-directed system than a habit-learning system. So I use reward because I'm interested in both of those things, but your point is very well taken. And it is absolutely the case that all of the the strongest signals, which makes sense because the plesia don't have consciousness and probably don't experience pleasure, but they've been eating just fine. <laughs> so there are these unconscious reinforcing pathways. That that's where really most of the action is. Yeah. Thanks. Do we have any other, other questions? No? OK. So I just wanted to uh, direct everybody's attention. Oh, let's give Dana one more round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a great talk.